All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for sticking around for the last talk. Uh, it's been a great conference, a lot of great talks. Uh, tough crowd to follow, but uh, I'm going to try. Uh, my name is Omar Sandoval. I'm a software engineer at Meta. I'm on the Linux kernel team there. Uh, on the kernel, I've mainly worked on ButterFS and previously did some block layer work. But today, I'm going to be talking about my other project, which is the Dragon Debugger. Uh, and this is going to be more of a demo-focused talk rather than just telling you all about Dragon, how great it is. I'm just going to show it to you. Um, and then afterwards, I'll tell you a little bit about how it works, some future plans that I have, uh, and hopefully get some feedback from you guys as well. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with that. So before I actually dive straight into the demo, let me talk a little bit about what Dragon actually is. So the tagline I use for Dragon is that it's a programmable debugger. Uh, what I mean by that is that as opposed to classical debuggers where you have a CLI interface with a fixed set of commands that you use, instead of that, uh, Dragon just gives you a, a bunch of APIs that you can program with. Uh, and more specifically, it, the program you're debugging for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the Linux kernel. Uh, it takes all the variables and types from the Linux kernel from that program and then wraps them up, does some magic, and exposes them as just Python variables and types. And then there are countless things you can do with that. Uh, so it works on either uh, kernel core dump, uh, the currently live running kernel on, on your machine, and also uh, user space core dumps, user space uh, live processes as well. So then on top of those uh, basic facilities for exposing the, the variables and types. Uh, Dragon also has a big library of what we call kernel sp uh, what we call helpers. And these are basically kernel specific functions that know about common data structures in the kernel uh, for stuff like linked lists, red black trees, uh, task structs, stuff like that. And those all, all uh, give you kernel specific information that would be tedious to get otherwise. So another thing I want to talk about before jumping to the demo is a uh, Y Dragon, uh, m meaning there's all these other debugging tools. Uh, why did I create yet another one? So uh, pretty much as soon as I joined Meta, I I was tasked with helping out with some investigations of some bugs, uh, and some of them were really hairy, uh, and I tried all the existing tools. And I found that they didn't do exactly what I wanted. So for example, uh, there's GDB. Uh, we all know and love and probably use all the time for, oh yeah. I, I just I look at your third bullet there, the BPF, Ftrace, Print K, don't work for post-morning uh -huh. debugging. debugging. Um, again, uh, in about two weeks, I'll be at the Open Source Summit in Austin. I'm giving a talk called Postmortem, K-Exec, K-Dump, and Ftrace. <laughs> cool. just, just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be looking out for that. Great. Well, um, anyways, yeah, so uh, GDB has a scripting interface, which is kind of similar to Dragon's, but uh, in my experience, it was didn't feel very natural to use. And also, its Linux kernel support is clunky. Maybe that's gotten better since I tried it, but anytime I tried to either point it at the running kernel or a VM core, I'd, I'd had a bunch of issues. And then uh, we also have uh, Crash, which is a tool that's specifically built for the Linux kernel, uh, basically as a bunch of extensions on top of GDB. And uh, I use this a bunch, and it, it was super useful. Uh, Crash defines a bunch of commands that will then know about uh, common kernel data structures, kind of like uh, Dragon helpers. But I found that anytime I wanted to do anything beyond what those built-in uh, commands in Crash could do, I I had to jump through a bunch of hoops, usually meaning dumping it to a text file, doing a bunch of post processing on it with like awk and grep. And that's not a great environment. You know Crash has plugins. Yeah, I, I've tried to write some, and it's and, not very and that's, fun. One of them is actually you could extract the ftrace ring buffers and, you, and read the ftrace.dat trace file from it. Sure, so. yeah, are those written in C? Yes. OK. So uh, 
All right. Uh, I, I love C, but for when I'm when I'm trying to debug something, I'm not trying to deal with C. <laughs> um, okay. And then there's BPF, ftrace, and printk. We've heard a bunch about BPF and ftrace, and I'm very interested to hear about postmortem ftrace. But uh, for the most part, uh, those are great if you if you're reproducing the bug and and have it happening right now. Um, like, I think no one no one reaches for printk more than me for that sort of thing. But uh, if you log on to a, a production system that's deadlocked, and uh, or if you're dealing with a kernel core dump, then those aren't going to help you very much. So uh, Dragon kind of aimed to address all of these shortcomings. And then another thing kind of on top of that 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 was nice starting Dragon as a, its own project from the ground up was that it was from the start designed to be usable as a library. Uh, I'll get more into that later, but, uh, but that's ended up to be super powerful. All right, so now I can just jump into, into demoing. So first thing I'm going to do is just give a brief introduction to how you use Dragon and, all the, and just the super basic concepts in it. Uh, how's that font size? Good? Great. All right. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so uh, this is my, this is it's a VM running 5.18 right now. Uh, and all I have to do to start Dragon is run Dragon. Uh, if you're running it as a, you need, it needs to be run as root because it's touching internal kernel stuff. So it uh, definitely needs that. Uh, you start it, it finds all the debugging information, blah, blah, blah. And then it drops into it drops you into a Python shell. So uh, it initializes this Python shell with a bunch of Dragon libraries. Uh, and the most important thing it gives you is this prog object. Uh, so this, is, this isn't this is a standard Python. This is just uh, something that Dragon initializes the Python environment with, which represents the program that you're debugging. Since I'm, I just ran Dragon with no arguments, by default, it's going to debug the running kernel. Um, so then you can do the basic stuff that you can do in any, in any debugger. Uh, so in Dragon, you use the dictionary syntax to look up a variable. And you can do operations with that variable. Not super interesting to add to the Jiffy's counter, but it's something you can do. And uh, the reason this works is that this isn't just printing out the string with the value and the type. Uh, this is actually, don't worry about the Python specific part of this, but this is actually uh, Dragon's uh, representation of a variable. So it knows the type, uh, it knows the address, and that's how you can do extra stuff with it. Uh, so the uh, Jiffy 64 isn't super interesting, but we can look at a struct, which is maybe a little more interesting. And it pretty prints the struct. Uh, again, nothing groundbreaking there. And you can also access members inside of the struct. So uh, in C, we have the dot operator and the error operator. Python doesn't have an error operator, so dot works for, for both. Uh, so we can print out like the, the name of the, the task. This is just the task member in struct task struct. Same thing with the PID. Cool. Again, nothing super groundbreaking here. It's just a nice little Python wrapper on top of on top of the variables and stuff. But let's say we want to do something a little more interesting. So uh, task struct has a list head, which uh, represents all the children tasks of this task. Uh, so maybe we want to know how many tasks that the idle task has. That's what init task represents, the, the, the idle task, or one of the idle tasks. Um, so we, we, we just want to know how many tasks are children of this task. So to do that, if you're doing this in C, uh, you, you would probably just use list for each. If I didn't let you use list for each, then you would just write a loop that iterates over the, the linked list. Uh, so we know that linked lists in the Linux kernel are just cyclic doubly linked lists. So we can just write some, we would just write some code to do that iteration. So you can just, you can also just do that in Dragon. So let's say n is going to be our counter of how many elements are in the, in the linked list. And then we want to know what node we're currently at. So let me actually grab that node. 
So again, Python doesn't have an ampersand operator. So this dot address of is basically if, as if you had done ampersand uh, of this children task. Sorry, it, Python does have an ampersand operator for bitwise operations, but not a unary ampersand operator. Okay, so now we can we want to grab the the first node in the list, which is head dot next, and then we just write pretty much the loop that you would write in C. While we haven't reached back around to the head of the list, just bump our counter and then don't forget to loop to the uh, next entry. Okay, so we just ran that loop and now it turns out that init task has uh, two children, easy as that. So um, what if we want to do something a little bit fancier and we want to know what those children are? Uh, so. For, for that, uh, again, if we were doing this in C, we'd do something like list for each entry. Uh, but we can do something similar by saying, okay, for each node in the linked list, we just want to go from that node to the task struct containing it, and then print out some information about that task struct. So we're gonna write a similar uh, loop to what we just wrote. And now I want to get the task that this node corresponds to. Uh, so you'd use container of here if you weren't allowed to use container uh, list for each entry. So it turns out that Dragon has container of that works pretty much the same as in C. You pass in the node, you pass in the type, in this case as a string, and then you pass in the name of the node member in task struct, which for this list is sibling. So then all we have to do, now we can just print some information about what the children are what the children are, and again, can't forget to loop to the next entry, and we'll just run this loop, and easy as that, those are the children of uh, the idle task, our init program and kthreadd. So it kind of sucks that we have to write this loop twice, uh, like the, the business logic of what we're actually trying to get, like the interesting information here uh, and here is mixed in with our looping logic. So what we'd probably want to do then, since this is just Python, we'd want to uh, kind of abstract that away. Uh, so maybe we're used to list for each in the kernel. Uh, so let's, let's write a my list for each function in Python that takes the, the head of the list we're trying to iterate and then does the same loop that we, we've gotten familiar with. So again, start start the iteration, loop over, and then the the Python syntax here is uh, we're writing a generator which just generates each node one by one, and so we'll we'll return that one node and then we'll loop to the next one until this runs out. So now I can write that same loop that I did earlier to count things, but instead of writing the the looping logic there, I'll just loop, I'll just use this helper that I just defined. And now I can just bump my counter by one, and same thing. So this time I didn't have to worry about any of that uh, list for each stuff. So it'd be a waste for everyone to have to write this my list for each function, and every time you're doing a debugging session to remember to copy and paste it into, into your, uh, into your uh, session. So. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Dragon provides helpers that already does all of this for you. So uh, there's already a list for each helper that is basically almost exactly what I just wrote up above. Um, there's actually also a list for each entry helper. So instead of the loop I wrote earlier to print out in, uh, the information, this one up here, uh, I can write something that uses the list for each entry helper and it looks a lot like the, the C one, except you have to pass some stuff as strings. Passes a, that, that. Uh, so the name of the type, the list head, and the name of the member. And we can write the same thing we did earlier, but we just use uh, Dragon's built-in helper for that. So uh, there are a lot more helpers that do stuff that's a lot more involved in just looping over a linked list. You can actually get the list of all of them from within Dragon 
by uh, running uh, help on Dragon Helpers at Linux, and there's a bunch of them here. I usually prefer to actually go to the online documentation instead, just because it's a little nicer to read uh, than reading the kind of the raw RST for it. So for this, I would go to the helpers page, and usually I don't even remember what helpers I've written, uh, and so what I'll usually do is just Control F for. I don't know, maybe I want to get something to, to do with file descriptors. I can control F for a file descriptor and see. Okay, I wrote a, apparently I have an fget helper that, uh, given the task in an FD, gives you the file description uh, in the kernel. Cool. Um, and there is actually a little more that Dragon can do uh, beyond just uh, variables and types. Uh, one of those things is stack traces. So, uh, again, going back to the prog object, I can call the stack trace method on it. Uh, pass it a PID. Uh, you can also pass in a task struct. Uh, but if I call prog that stack trace on this PID, it gives me the stack trace. And again, just like the uh, Jiffy's object I showed earlier isn't just a, a string that it's printing out, uh, this is actually a full fledged object. And one thing you can do with this is index into it uh, to get a specific stack frame. So for example, uh, if I want to look at the, the EP poll stack frame, that's entry four in here. So I could just look at that stack frame. Uh, when I do that, I print out a little extra information about it. In this case, uh, it turns out EP poll was inlined into its collar and, and what symbol it's in and all of that. But uh, then I can look at the local variables inside of that stack frame even. So I read the, the EP poll code earlier. It has a, a variable in there called EP. Uh, which is the event poll object, kind of. And I can look up that local variable inside of the stack frame. So you can do a lot of this stuff with existing debuggers. But what Dragon does differently is that it gives it to you as a nice API and you can program on top of it. So kind of here's just a slide of, of all, the, all the stuff I just described, uh, just as a, for a reference for later. But now that I've kind of given you the basics, I want to jump into a case study. Uh, so I want to look at an actual bug that we hit in production at Meta, uh, how we debugged it, and uh, I'm going to give you the the uh, abridged version because when you're actually debugging something like this, you're trying all sorts of different things and some things aren't panning out, uh, and eventually you find the right way. But And I actually wasn't the one who originally did this investigation, it was Chris Mason, uh, but I, I liked I liked this bug, so I wanted to talk through it. So let me give a little background on on the bug. Uh, so we got a bug report from some of our uh, some of the people in our container team that container creation was failing on some machines with Enospace. Uh, so it turned out not to be an actual disk being full. Uh, we used uh, before we even got the dragon, we just used strace to figure out which system call was failing, and then we used Red Snoop, uh, which is a tool built. By uh, by Andre, oh, I probably shouldn't try to pronounce his last name. <laughs> Andre N, uh, which uses BPF to basically find where in where in this whole function that you're targeting uh, did a did an error bubble up from. Uh, so that's a super cool tool uh, worth its own talk. But basically. We use these two two things to find out that it, this is the Eno space was coming from a limit on the number of IPC namespaces that you're allowed to have uh, per user. Uh, but then when you when we logged into the machine, uh, we saw that there were actually only a few IPC namespaces. So I reproduced this bug earlier. Uh, this this thing is just looping here, trying to create uh, trying to create new IPC namespaces and getting getting a you know space from it and let me come back here and show there's only a few that are actually alive uh, the reproducer also creates a few that it keeps around to kind of represent the, the actual containers that we're still running okay so I'm going to just jump to that place in the code that we found using ret snoop. Hopefully that's okay to read. Uh, so it was in this create IPC namespace function. And basically if 
this inc IPC namespaces function failed, then we would return an Eno space. So uh, I can jump to the definition of this inc, inc IPC namespaces, which turns out to just be a wrapper around this inc u count. Um, and right now I'm just trying to figure out why this is failing. So if we jump into inc u count, it looks like it looks up the the some counters per uh, namespace UID pair, and then it tries to bump those bump that counter. And if that bumping that counter would go above the maximum value, um, probably should have mentioned what the maximum value is. Max IPC namespaces. It's this really big number, which is way bigger than five. Um, if you try to go above the maximum value, then we we fail. Uh, so now I want to try with Dragon to find out what the counter currently is at uh, to see if that will tell us why, uh, or s s to see if it's legitimately actually somehow that high, which wouldn't make much sense. So I can jump to the alloc u counts function, and now I see that alloc u counts does a hash table lookup in this big u counts hash table thing. Okay. Uh, so if, if I wanted to actually do the hash table lookup, then I'd have to re-implement the hash function. But I, I don't feel like doing that in Dragon, so let's just loop over the whole hash table. Uh, so I'm going to do this in a separate file and then load that file into the session rather than doing, doing it interactively, uh, just because that sometimes ends up being a little easier for me. And Dragon lets you do that. So let's, let's write a function to find this uCounts entry that we're interested in. So first thing we want to do is loop over all the buckets in the hash table. So then all I have to do is, what's it called? U counts hash table. And write a Python loop over that variable. This will give me every element in the array, because if you see up here, this is just an array of hlist heads. Uh, so that'll give me each hlist head in the, in the hash table. Now I want to... Uh, look at the, the hash table entries. If you haven't seen how a hash table is done in the Linux kernel, this is what it usually looks like. You have an hlist, you loop over every hlist entry in there and make sure that you didn't just get a hash collision, that you got the actual uh, thing you're looking for. So let's replicate this loop that we have in, in this find uCounts function, uh, which is something like for uCounts in hlist for each entry. This is another helper that Dragon already provides. And we want a variable of struct u counts. We want this bucket th that we're currently on, and uh, the entries in it are apparently called node. Okay, so now we want to see if this is the entry we're looking for. So uh, it looks like we're comparing two things. We're comparing if the UID is the UID we're looking for and if the namespace is the, the namespace we're looking for. Uh, in this case, the namespace that we're matching is a, the user namespace that the UID is in, not, not an IPC namespace. That could, could be a little confusing. So l let's look at this UID equals function. All it does is unwrap this KUIDT, which is just a struct to give strong typing to the UID uh, and just compares that. So. If we want to look at the UID in here, we can just do uid.val. Uh, UID and uh, the reproducer I'm running is running as root, so as zero. Then the other thing we want to look at is the namespace. So what namespace do I want to compare against? Well, I'm not running the reproducer inside a, its own container. So uh, it just it's just the initial user namespace. And that's, that's one that I just remember. Uh, so if these match, then we found the hash entry that we're looking for. And if not, then uh, let's raise an error. OK, so now we have this function that, if I type it all correctly, will return to us the, the uCounts entry. So let's just call it. What did I call this? Find uCounts. And let's print it out see if we got it right. OK, so the way to load all this code that I just wrote into Dragon is exec script. This this is a, a Dragon helper that basically takes everything in this in the, the file you give it and loads it in as if you had typed it. So like the functions you define are available there. Um, it'll run the code and do that. So cool. Looks like it it printed out this uCount structure uh, and it printed out the array of uCounts. Uh, 
so uh, I don't remember which, or I don't know which one of these is the, the one I'm interested in. So let's pop all the way back in the stack to make you count to here. So the one we wanted was uh, the you count IPC namespaces. So the array is called you count, and then we just want to look up this you count IPC namespaces. Since that's just a constant defined in the kernel as an enum, we can look it up and use that as the index rather than needing to hard code it or anything. So now we can find out what that counter is. Okay. So it's a really big number that's pretty much right up to the limit of the IPC namespaces. And that's pretty confusing because when I ran LSNS, there were only a handful of namespaces. So now I'm, we're thinking maybe there's some sort of reference count leak or something. So let's look for who's responsible for decrementing this. So l luckily this uh, decrement IPC namespaces function is right here. So let's see who calls that. Uh, so first one is just the error path of create IPC namespace. Uh, spoiler warning, that's not it. Uh, the second one is the, the function that's actually supposed to free this namespace. So free IPC namespace. Uh, and that is called by free IPC. And that is a work item. OK, so we have some worker that's supposed to be freeing IPC namespaces. And it looks like there's a list of, I of free IPC, or of IPC namespaces that need to be freed. And this worker just kind of turns through that list and frees them. OK, so what I want to know now is if this worker is running anywhere. So there's lots of ways to do this. Uh, since we're on a live system, we could, uh, we could look at proc or, or run perf and, and look at like perf top or stuff like that. But since this is a talk on Dragon, I'm going to do it with Dragon. And this is something you could also do on a core dump. So I want to look at every task that's running on the system right now. So there's a for each task helper in Dragon that just gives you each task struct in the kernel. And then I want to look at blocked tasks. This is, uh, this is a common thing that, that we do when we're debugging a lot of issues. We just look at all the tasks that are, are blocked. And sometimes that'll, just looking at that will give you some hints. Uh, so just like, uh, so we want to look at the state of the task. If it's in D state uh, specifically, then let's take a look at it. So let's get the stack trace for that task. Uh, like I said earlier, you can also pass a task struct rather than just a PID to this function. And let's just print that out. So if I call that, would you look at that? There's a block task and free IPC namespace. Okay, so now let's figure out what's on these lists. Maybe, maybe, there, maybe there's stuff stuck in there somehow. Okay, so for that, I can look at each stack frame in the stack trace, and then I can check, uh, I can just match it by name. So I'm specifically looking for free IPC. Now there are a couple of things I want to look at. Uh, I want to look at the free IPC list and see what's on that list. And I want to look at the, uh, the current list, it's, it's, or the current list entry it's working on, which is uh, this variable n. Uh, so these are instances of a, of a, L list, which is a lockless, singly linked list in the kernel. Uh, it's basically uh, what you'd expect as a null terminated singly linked list, except that the uh, there's all sorts of uh, fancy lockless stuff to make sure that it's safe to to do stuff concurrently. So uh, we can Dragon doesn't have helpers for those because they're not super common, and I hadn't run into them before uh, this bug. So uh, I just want to know how many there are in there, so I can just write a, a quick function for that right now. So uh, let's count how many entries there are in a list rooted at this node. So sorry, I should call that node. And this looks like the, the loop we wrote earlier, except it's a different kind of list. So while node, and uh, node equals node.next. And then let's just return n. So I want to print this out for two different lists. I want to know for the uh, global list, how many are there in there? So uh, now, now I can use the functionality of Dragon that looks up local variables. So I want to look up the, uh, sorry, well, this is a global variable, but we're going to look it up in the scope of this, of this frame. It, it ends up working the same way. Uh, for IPC list, 
and uh, the so this is an L list head. The list node, the first list node is list node is called first. So let's just print that out. And then the other one we want is the list node for this current entry n. So same idea, uh, except we have to grab it slightly differently. So this one actually is a local variable, so we have to use uh, the, the local variable syntax for that. And it's not just a link node, it's this IPC namespace type. Um, so I need to call mount ls, or sorry, the, the entry in there is called mount ls, and I need address of it. Okay. So if I did this right, we'll see how many entries are in this in both of these lists. And oh, this time the task wasn't running. Okay. There we go. So free IPC list has 27,000 entries in there and has the rest of them. Now we're kind of starting to figure out what's going on. Um, the IPC namespaces that are supposed to be freed are still alive in these lists, not being cleared up, and that's keeping the reference or the the limit count uh, kind of uh, pinned up too high. So now we we looked around at some other things, and if you look at this look at this stack trace, you'll see a call to synchronize RCU. So that's that's interesting, and that's actually kind of exactly what's going on here. For each one of these IPC namespaces that we're freeing uh, asynchronously, we're calling synchronize RCU. Synchronize RCU is not super fast. Uh, so if you're creating, uh, creating IPC namespaces and then uh, exiting and kind of uh, leaving them to be freed, if you're doing that faster than synchronize RCU is, is uh, churning through each of these entries on the list, Eventually, you're going to end up with this huge backlog that goes over the the limit, and uh, and you'll hit these eno spaces that don't make much sense. Uh, so from there, we did a little bit of, of of Git blaming, and found that there had been a somewhat recent change to uh, make free IPC use this work queue. Beforehand, uh, it was being done synchronously uh, when you put the last reference to the uh, when you put the last reference to the IPC namespace. Uh, now, this change made it so it was being done in, in a, a work queue, which made uh, unsure and exit calls a lot faster, but uh, created this bug that we only hit because it turns out we had some crash looping container that was using up all the namespaces, or all the references on the namespaces, and then when we finally said, okay, uh, you get out of here, let's try to start a, a new workload, then that one hit, hit this. So that's a real world example of how, how we use Dragon. Uh, so like I showed in the tutorial, a lot of that stuff that Dragon can do is pretty basic in terms of uh, compared to other debuggers. But once you make it programmable, you can do all this much more complicated stuff that, uh, that uh, then that would have been really tedious to do otherwise. So he, Dragon ha has a few advantages in my mind over other tools. Uh, ideally, if you're not in meetings all day, uh, you spend most of your time reading code and writing code. Uh, and then someone sends you a bug report and you have to context switch, use this completely other uh, skill set to, to debug, um, which to me was always annoying. Uh, but doing stuff in Dragon feels like you're just coding. It just turns out that the code that you're writing is to debug other code. Uh, and it's, uh, Dragon also gives you a familiar environment, whether you're a C hacker or whether you're really experienced with Python. Uh, for all the helpers that, I, that we have to Dragon, we try to mimic the in-kernel functions as much as possible. Uh, so there are little differences here and there, either because Python, Python syntax limitations or, uh, or extra context needed. But uh, for the most part, we're, we'll, we try to copy that one to one. So if you know the kernel function, uh, odds are that there is a the, the dragon function to do the same thing has the same name and works almost the same way. And then also uh, the the scripts you write, uh, or even just the debugging sessions you have, can be reused and shared in a more meaningful way than kind of just a screen capture of of like a crash or a GDB session or something. Uh, for example, uh, one thing I've done before is I'm debugging some issue on one machine. There's something that looks a little weird, uh, but I'm not sure if it actually means anything. 
Uh, so I'll take the script I, I wrote on that one machine, SCP it over to another machine, and see if the same thing is happening on the other machine. If it is, uh, then there might be a pattern there. If it's not, then, oh, this is just coincidence. I shouldn't go down that route. And you can also share these scripts, either just say, like, hey, here's my cool war story, um, or uh, share it with the reproducer when you send up a, uh, send up a either a, a usually the bug fix if you've gone to the point of debugging it. But uh, then a skeptic maintainer will not only just be able to run your reproducer and see the problem happen, they can run your dragon script and see that the root cause analysis you did actually is correct. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about how dragon works under the hood. Uh, Again, I, I think Dragon is similar to kind of the existing tools and how it works, but uh, it just gives you a much cleaner interface on top of that. So it, it glues together a few things. Uh, LibDragon is the, the implements all the core functionality, uh, and that's written in C rather than Python. Uh, so Dragon basically glues together uh, dwarf debugging information. Uh, we I, we have some fancy tricks that we do to do that very quickly, so Dragon starts up, uh, much faster than other debuggers. But uh, then it also reads from, uh, for the live kernel, it'll read from proc kcore, which basically gives you the current kernel memory as a core dump, uh, or a, a user space program, whatever, there are a few, few different things you can target. And then it emulates uh, the, the language you're, you're debugging in. We have limited C++ support, uh, but it's it's mainly just C at this point. And then there's Python bindings for LibDragon. The helpers are just pure Python code for the most part, written on top of the Python bindings. And then there's a CLI interface, which uh, puts all that together. But uh, Dragon does have a few limitations. If you're debugging a live program, of course, the live program is going to keep doing stuff while you're debugging. Nothing we can really do about that. Uh, I haven't run into it too much in practice, uh, just something to be aware of. And helpers obviously need to be kept in sync with uh, kernel changes. Uh, so to do that, uh, I run Dragon on all the versions we support, which is basically everything on kernel.org, plus some that I just don't bother to delete as long as, as, long as things keep working without too much extra effort. Uh, and it needs dwarf information, which can be uh, a big limitation if, if you don't want to install like a multi-gigabyte package. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Stephen Brennan at Oracle has been working on making, uh, putting all the pieces in place so you can use Dragon without dwarf information. So as Arnaldo talked about yesterday, uh, the kernel is almost self-describing at this point. We have BTF, which has the definitions of every type in the kernel. We have ORC, uh, which uh, tells you how to unwind everything in the kernel. And then we have chaos sims, which tells you the locations of variables in the kernel. And all of these are available at runtime. Uh, because they're in the kernel memory, they get dumped into core dumps. Uh, and that's all there. But there are a few missing pieces. Uh, the biggest one is that BTF does not have uh, inf uh, the type information for variables, except for per CPU variables. Because the only thing the, the uh, BPF verifier needs at runtime is uh, to verify that if it's a, a per CPU variable that then you can use a per CPU helper. Um, but if we wanted to be able to use Dragon without having dwarf information, we'd need to add all the variables to BTF. And uh, then uh, that has some implications, mainly the fact that it grows the size of the BTF uh, on Steven's machine. It went from 4 megabytes to 6 megabytes. So this is a trade-off that a Linux distro could make. Uh, do they want people to be able to debug stuff without installing an extra package. If so, then you can, you can uh, add a couple of extra megabytes to the file and also add, it'll be runtime memory usage. Uh, with, uh, we've also discussed making a loadable kernel module so you would only want, need to load it uh, when you want to do the sort of debugging. But then you wouldn't have it if you uh, dumped core without having loaded that module. So there are trade-offs to be made there. But uh, all the pieces are, are or he's, uh, Stephen's working on it. It's almost there. But uh, it's, it doesn't give you everything that Dragon has uh, because Dwarf has a lot more information than all these other tools, including local variables and inline functions and stuff like that. But it, it has a lot. Um, so I'm not going to be able to talk about this too much, but uh, just because I'm running out of time. But uh, Dragon, I originally envisioned it as just an interactive debugger. 
but I, like I mentioned earlier, I designed it from the ground up as a library, and it turns out it ends up being much more generic, and uh, this lets you use it for uh, lots of other things, whether that's uh, inspecting or just looping over like type information to figure out what to do like memory profiling. Uh, you don't have to use it for debugging bugs. Uh, you can use it to introspect things, like rather than exposing things to debugfs, which then the kernel needs to kind of manage and, and maintain. Uh, you can just write a Dragon program to replace a bunch of stuff that you would have exposed read only through debugfs. Uh, Dragon doesn't do anything right uh, on the right side of things yet. Um, but there's a lot more you can do with it than just these interactive debugging things that I talked about. And then here's a bunch of future work. Uh, the, we're always adding more helpers and uh, there's work in progress to add support for more architectures, uh, better support for user space in C++, uh, including ptrace and gdb stub. Uh, like I said, Dragon's read only, so it doesn't have breakpoints or anything like that yet. Uh, so basically, I, I found, and at Meta, we've we found that Dragon makes it really easy to, to debug these super complicated problems. And it gives you these building blocks that can be used for uh, other use cases. So please try it out, uh, uh, file bug requests, pull requests, uh, and if I have time for questions, let's take some. Um, thanks. You need current form. Uh, I see a little bit of more interest than the scripting with uh, Crash and uh, plugins like f 3 and stuff like that. But there is a lot of potential. As you say, it's a library. And so when you have to debug some uh, VM core that you are sent, you spend a lot of time to try to get the, uh, the situation, uh, to get the, 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 the picture that was the, the system was in uh, when it crashed. And if you can have, uh, let's say, bind it to something like Jupyter Notebook uh, and provide an interface when you have directly the full listing of process and for when you click on one of these process you already have all the, the stuff like files open, locked, timers, uh, every element it has, it will be really nice and really powerful to have all the information quickly to assess uh, easily uh, the, the situation. And then you have also the scripting, uh, which is pretty nice, and also to uh, s uh, to be able to share the context, the, the debugging context, with other people, so you don't have to send the VM core of many gigabytes, and they don't have the debug info and stuff like that. So you can just share a new URL and also uh, clean it, so you don't uh, leak uh, private data. That would be really uh, lovely when you have to send it to many providers and UOM and uh, stuff like that. All right, yeah, I really like that idea. Uh, this is probably a stupid question, but do you maintain a collection of scripts to, for example, make it easier, um, I don't know, if I'm interested in a specific subsystem, uh, dump me the submission queue entries in IO Uring, for example? Uh, so there are a handful of, of scripts in there which are kind of standalone programs that you execute that just have a dragon shebang and uh, use that. Uh, there, there's not anything for IOU rings specifically. They're, they're mostly for basic stuff, except for, for one, there's a BPF inspect.py in the Dragon repository, uh, which basically uh, is a way to print out information for BPF that is not exposed via any other user space APIs, just because the BPF guys didn't want to uh, commit to a user space API for that, so Dragon gives you an easy way to do that. I think right now, it. That script might be broken on newer kernel versions. I think, uh, Quentin Monet had some patches for me, but uh, but uh, so those are that is kind of within the scope of, of Dragon, I'd say, to have tools built on top of it to to be distributed with it. But uh, there's only a handful right now. I'd, I'd be happy to take more. Okay, you'd be happy to take more. Yep, great, cool. And because what will happen likely is that ten people will have similar scripts to do the same thing over and over. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think the big thing is just going to be writing test cases for those, just like I have the test cases for the helpers. Cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's more a comment along the, the lines of the first uh, question, mm -hmm. whereas uh, that's a tool I had done a long time ago, inspired by something that was on a proprietary Unix system where whenever the system would crash, when it would come back up, it would use a standard set of commands to just spit out a text file with the, the support process. And every interesting thing that the uh, support guy can take and have the first look at the crash dump. So that could be interesting to have. And it also goes along the lines of having standard set of scripts that we can use. And uh, But in order to get that to be working, you would need what you were describing is the extra two megabyte of uh, of information in the kernel already available, mm -hmm. so we don't have to uh, include the dwarf uh, the packages on the system to be uh, yep. decoded. Yeah, so I, I, sh I, I would have mentioned if I had a little more time that internally at Meta we do have something similar to what you just described. Uh, we have a system called Bandicoot because of Crash Bandicoot's video game character. Anyways, it's a system called Bandicoot that uh, is built on top of KDump. And when the system comes back up, it runs a bunch of Dragon code to collect information about the system, like what processes were running, what BPF programs were loaded, um, and and what the like kind of rebuild what proc mem info would have said, stuff like that. And it includes that along uh, and sends that into kind of our 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 various data data processing pipelines. Uh, so Dragon totally enables that sort of use case. Uh, I think it would make a lot of sense to to have that. Uh, to extract those scripts out and, and share them in the in the repo rather than just having them in our internal repository. You mentioned briefly other architectures. Can you talk a little bit about the status and yeah. can, can it work cross architecture? Like, can I take yep. a core dump from ARM64 and debug that on x86 host? Yeah. So uh, most of Dragon, uh, by virtue of Dwarf being mostly architecture agnostic, uh, most of Dragon is is architecture agnostic. Uh, there, there are some things that are x86 only. The biggest one right now is uh, anything that requires uh, walking page tables and resolving virtual addresses, which for VM cores will be anything other than like the direct kernel mappings and uh, so stuff like VM alloc allocations and module allocations uh, need to know how to walk page tables, which requires some architecture specific support. Uh, and that's only implemented for x86 right now, but it, it wouldn't be too much work. Uh, now that I have the, the Libre computer ARM thing, that's probably going to be the, the first thing I'm going to do with it, uh, implement uh, ARM page table walking for that. Uh, and it, it will work uh, cross-platform, uh, meaning that you can take a ARM64 core dump and debug it from your x86 machine as long as you have the, the debugging files available for the ARM kernel. Thank you. Okay. All right, looks like we're out of time. Thanks, everyone.